Welcome to the Baby Bunting Live series. This is season two, episode 44. Tonight we are talking about early childhood health nurse visits and we will provide some information on the services and how child health nurses can support families with new babies. We have invited Belinda Joyce along to answer our questions as well as yours. Belinda is a midwife, maternal and child health nurse and author of Survive and Enjoy Your Baby. Thanks for joining us again tonight, Belinda. We're going to be covering all things child health nurse and service. So if you have any questions throughout the episode, be sure to pop them in the comments box and we'll answer them as, um, as many as possible after the episode. Belinda, you've joined us before on Facebook Live. Welcome back. For our newest and expectant parents, could you tell us a little about yourself? Sure, Janelle, thanks for having me on. Um, I am a midwife, as you said, and a maternal and child health nurse, but most importantly, I'm the mother of four children, my own children. Um, and I just really feel like, um, I guess, as new parents, the maternal and child health service can really support all of those new families out there, the new parents. And it's a really, um, I guess, a great way of letting everyone know what we've got to offer tonight. Uh, Belinda, do all the states in Australia have a child health nurse service? They do. Um, we we run on different names in just about every state, just to make it a little bit confusing, especially if you were to move from state to state. So in Victoria, we're the Maternal and Child Health Service, and in other states, they're different names like Child Health Service, Child and Family Service, Child Health Clinic. They're all just a little bit different. And do the nurses have different names as well? They do. So we're maternal and child health nurses in Victoria. In some of the other states, they're child health nurses, child and family nurses. Uh, it's just to keep everyone guessing. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> what qualifications do child health nurses usually have? Yes, yeah, so most of the child health nurses are um, registered nurses to begin with who've gone back and done further postgraduate study in child and family health nursing or community nursing um, and then in Victoria where all, all the maternal and child health nurses are also midwives as well. And what else do these services do? I think the main thing that we do we're there for new families when you have your first baby um, and we're there to really help with monitoring growth and development, answering all those questions that new families have, um, really just trying to optimise or um, get the best outcomes for families in those early days. Um, and we're there for you to, I guess, let us know if you're having some real challenges or not coping with certain aspects because becoming a new parent is a massive life transition. Mm -hmm. It is. How do parents find their local service, Belinda? Look, if you give birth in the hospital, most of the time the hospitals will um, pass your information on or give you the details to contact because, again, in every state it's a little bit different. Um, if you birth at home, your midwife will have the, that information as well. And um, certainly in Victoria, the birth notice is always passed on. It's actually legislated, so it's passed on to the maternal um, child health service in your area and we have to make uh, contact within those first couple of weeks. And is there a cost to parents for this service? No, thankfully in Australia we're very, very lucky that our governments um, fully fund uh, child health services. They can actually see the, the value in that, um, in finding any issues early. It actually saves the country a lot of money and um, has like I said before, much better outcomes for families. Oh, that's great. And how often do, um, do you have appointments to see the nurse? Yeah, so again, every state's a little bit different, but generally we follow a pattern of seeing families much more often when the baby's little, and then it spaces out and uh, gets less frequent as babies and children grow up. Um, so in Victoria, we see everyone for their home visits. So soon after they've returned home, then at two weeks, four weeks, four months, eight months, 12 months, 18 months, then at two years old and three and a half. So there's 10 key age and stage visits. Uh, 
but it, it's different in every state. And also we often add in additional visits. So if a family needs or a baby perhaps that's um, a little bit slower at gaining weight in the beginning or has a um, something that we want to keep an eye on or if the parent has particular questions and things, we can book additional appointments as well. Okay, and Belinda, I guess at the moment during COVID lockdowns, um, restrictions in, in place in many um, many of the states, what could you um, tell us what's happening with regards to that? Yes, we're, I guess our services are getting better at dealing with the, um, the different COVID um, restrictions that are in place that come and go. And um, there's some parts of Australia that probably are running their service almost as usual. And then there's other parts of our country. So we're in Victoria where um, they're quite restricted at times. And based on the risk in your area, could be um, there could be a more restricted service. Mm -hmm. If there's a really, um, I guess, a high risk with the family, we'll often delay the appointment for a little while. Um, there's other ways that we can check if a baby's growing and we can use telehealth. So we're using a lot of telehealth right. services. So either the actual phone or using video calls. And we're all getting much more skilled up on using new technologies to really um, still support families in a slightly different way. Oh, Belinda, that's very reassuring. Um, it's difficult times um, having, a, having a newborn, um, but it's great to know that the services are still being available. So what usually happens on the first visit? So most services will come to your house for the first visit, which is really nice. Um, often it's quite early on and you're not really ready to get out and about. So it's a lovely time for us to come to you. Um, most times we'll introduce our service, let you know exactly what, what we do, um, how we can support your family, um, what we'd like to check on with the baby, uh, and really just let you know that we're there for you and that you can always come to us. Lovely. And can you also help with feeding challenges? Yes, we do a lot of um, talk about feeding at that initial visit. We really don't get that much information from the hospital. So we'll be asking lots of questions like, how are you choosing to feed your baby? There should be no judgment with the choices that you've made. And we'll always just, um, I guess, make sure that you've made informed decisions and that you've got all the information required. Um, if you're breastfeeding, we'll always be uh, checking on how that's going and trying to support you in that. If you've got some fairly big uh, breastfeeding challenges, which many people do in those early days, it's pretty normal, um, we'll often refer you back to see a lactation consultant who can spend one-on-one -on -one time with you just focused on breastfeeding. And again, they're providing a lot of their services over telehealth at the moment. If you're bottle feeding, we can talk about you know formula and the um, and the, the type of bottles and teats that you're using and how the baby's managing um, sucking and swallowing and um, and all of those things as well. So we do a lot around feeding. Okay, and do you also weigh the baby? Yes, um, at most first appointments we will weigh the baby just to make sure that they're growing um, and that they haven't lost too much weight. It really depends how early on we get in to the house to see you, whether the baby's putting on much weight yet. We'd like to always make sure that there's been at least 48 hours between weight checks for a newborn baby, and that's to give them ample opportunity to actually grow. Um, if the domiciliary midwives have, have visited yesterday and we've come out the next day, we don't wanna weigh them too soon it can look like they've lost weight. Um, we don't wanna just be weighing the milk in their tummy and because babies are constantly being filled up and then weighing and pooing, it really can make a difference if we weigh them before a feed and they've just done a big poo. Um, so we'd like to leave it at least 48 hours uh, so that we actually can see some growth because we don't wanna unnecessarily worry you. Of course. And will you also examine the baby? We'll do a, a, sort of a very brief examination. So more like um, observing the baby when we're weighing them, checking for signs of good hydration, uh, looking at you know, if they're awake, if there's a bit of eye contact, some newborns will sleep all the way through being unwrapped and undressed and weighed. Uh, but if they wake up looking to see if they're alert and interested in the world, um, 
one of the things we check all newborns for is little infections that they can get around their fingernails and their toenails and uh, that's called paronychia um, and that's easily treated with a little bit of betadine or something similar and just some little mittens over their hands or some socks on their hands to stop them sucking on them. Okay and what early parenting advice do you often give? A lot of the advice that we give at that visit is around um, I guess just knowing what's normal, N normal newborn behaviour, um, like I said a lot around feeding, really trying to boost the parents up and let them know that their concerns and things are really common and normal at that age. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and do you also check on the mother's health? Yes, we absolutely do. So the mum has so recently given birth. It's, um, I guess, lots of questions around recovery after the birth, depending on the type of birth, um, you know, um, how their wound is healing, um, if they're breastfeeding, how um, if their breasts and nipples are healthy, if they're comfortable, if they're overfull, or perhaps they've got very tender ni nipples. And then also looking at both parents and talking about their coping and their mental health and how they're managing that massive transition to parenthood. And it certainly is a massive transition, particularly for first time parents. So uh, Linda, can you tell us a little more about the child health record book that parents receive? Yes, so in every state they get a different book. In Victoria, ours is currently green <laughs> um, and it's the Health Learning and Development book. It has sections in it and every state has something similar to this where there's a section at the front for appointments. Um, usually at that first visit we'll give parents their next few appointments. Um, there's a section for immunisations, so when your baby's getting those you make sure you take your green book along. Um, then there's a section for growth where we, we can actually chart on growth charts your baby's growth over time. They're really interesting just to see um, what's average and, and where your baby sits. Uh, and then there's a section for every key age and stage visit, which gives a bit of information about the sorts of things babies of that age might be doing development wise. Um, and some sections where we can write some information and it's really important that parents know that this book is really for them. So uh, we'd love parents to fill, fill those sections in a little bit themselves with some of the developmental milestones that their baby's up to or their child's up to, um, because that, that can be a really lovely thing to look at later. Oh, it certainly is. It's, um, it's great to have that record um, from the early days through to um, yeah, slightly later. Now, how do you monitor for developmental progress? We know that all babies develop at a slightly different rate, but we also, I guess, are always observing babies and children when they come in to see us and asking their parents about what else they're doing at home because they don't always perform um, the, the things that we would like to see when they're in the room, but really just checking that they're meeting those basic milestones that we know that all babies will meet. Um, so things like by eight weeks, most newborn babies are able to, when they're on their tummy, actually lift their chin right up off the mat, keep their chin up there for a, a, a good little while, look around, um, and then come back down. And then by four months, most babies are starting to roll from front to back. Um, mm -hmm. By 18 months, most toddlers are walking. Those kind of milestones, I guess, are, are some of the really important ones. And if they're not meeting those milestones, it's not necessarily a really serious thing. It might just mean that we get you to come back for some more frequent visits so that we can just keep an eye that there is actually progress because a lot of babies and, and toddlers um, will continue to progress, but they're just taking a little bit longer to get there and that's not such a big deal. But if they've just stopped in their development and they're a little bit stuck, we wanna look at what's happening there. And uh, it's really important that even though we don't want to worry parents, that we do let you know so that we can get some early intervention in there and have much better outcomes for your child. So um, referring on to say a paediatric physiotherapist or an, a paediatric occupational therapist, perhaps a GP or a paediatrician, just to have a really good look at what's going on um, and to get that the correct early intervention needed. 
Thanks, Belinda. And I think you're right. It's just certainly not about wanting to worry young, not wanting to worry parents, but, um, but that early intervention is terrific. What other assessments do the child health nurses do? We do quite a few assessments. So we're always doing the, um, I guess, that physical examination, um, observing development and asking lots of questions around development, um, realising that the parents really are the expert there and, um, and see their baby and their child all day long and see a lot more than what we see. Um, we do do hip assessments on every baby at, at every visit, and that's mm -hmm. just to double check that they haven't got a hip that um, that the, the head of the femur is actually slipping out of the hip joint. And that can happen, um, it can be that way at birth or it can happen over time. It can be a developmental problem. Um, and so we will keep checking the hips very, very often that they're developing well and that um, that they're not dislocating and always referring on to the GP um, to get um, perhaps an ultrasound or a, an X-ray done down the track because it's a really easy thing to fix early on with bracing. But if your child makes it to 12 months and that hasn't been noticed or picked up, um, then they could require quite significant surgery. So you can see where that sort of getting in early and noticing that problem early, it's really very beneficial to that child's um, development. And, um, yeah. you know, you're going to be walking on those hips forever. They're really, really important. We also do vision screening um, for older children um, and SACS um, autism assessments. Again, they're not diagnosing autism. They're just looking for some of the red flags and concerning behaviours that we might see and then referring on for further assessment after that. Okay, that's great. And um, what are some of the common topics um, that you discuss with parents? I guess the most important topics or the, the most common topics are around um, feeding and um, development. Growth is a really big one. Sleep comes up very, very often and crying with newborn babies yeah. and um, immunisation, even pregnancy and birth for subsequent children when we're seeing them with their oldest and they're going back to have another baby. Uh, Behaviour for two-year-olds comes up really often. <laughs> we do lots around toilet training, tantrums and for older children, speech is another really big topic that comes up. Oh, that's interesting. So it really does take um, that assessment from birth right through to um, a slightly older age. And yes. should I make an appointment to see my child health nurse if my baby is sick? Not really. Um, we really are a well baby and a well child service. So we, we're looking at growth and development and answering all those different parenting questions. But if your baby's really sick, particularly if it's infectious or possibly contagious, um, they really can't come into the health centre because we see a lot of very young babies and really can't put them at risk. Yeah. Um, and especially at the moment, obviously our um, ability to see even a child with a snuffle or a cough, we just can't at the moment in mm. our service. So it is better to, to talk to your GP um, or if you think they're very ill, to actually head to the hospital and um, go to the emergency department for some um, immediate help. And if uh, if the babies, uh, I guess if you're concerned and you don't really know what to do, especially in those early days, you can usually phone a child health nurse. So um, you might be able to phone your local service and speak to the nurse that you usually see, or in a bigger service, just one of the nurses from that service might give you a call back and have a, have a chat. Um, otherwise, a lot of states have a 24-hour number. So in Victoria, we've got MCH Line, which is a fabulous yeah. resource. And when do families actually finish seeing their child health nurse? We can see children all the way up to school age, um, but commonly we finish around three and a half years old. That's our last key age and stage visit. And some states, their last is at four years old. So there's a little bit of difference. But if something came up that you were concerned about, say if you were having trouble with toilet training or speech or some of those things that um, older children are mastering, um, you can always make a, an additional appointment to come back and see us and that's, that's fine all the way up to school age. 
Okay. And Linda, do you also run the parent groups? We do. So um, we run the first time parent groups in Victoria. So they're for all um, new parents and um, they are what is commonly called um, mother's groups in the community, but we actually love seeing all parents. Um, yeah. And it, it, I think we're seeing more and more dads coming to groups now, or particularly if they're the primary carer, um, but we're really open to seeing um, both parents. It's a really great thing. And we know that those groups will often um, help families, I guess, or parents find that support network, which, um, you know, it's really important to know that other parents are going through some of the same things as you. They'll give you some really great suggestions and advice. You'll see some people whose babies are sleeping really well and some whose aren't sleeping so well, and you know that you're normal either way. Um, and that can be really helpful when you're a new parent. And we know that these groups, the aim of them really is to set up that support network. The aim isn't to give you education, although we do often, you know, talk about a topic at each um, at each group session. Uh, and we find some of these groups are still meeting years later, which is just brilliant. It is. And Belinda, what are your final thoughts um, regards the child health visits? Yeah, we'd really love um, all families to, um, I guess, make it bring their baby and their child to most of those scheduled appointments if they can. Reschedule them if your baby's sick, or, but try and fit them all in because they are aligned with major developmental um, milestones and it is good to just make sure that everything's going along really well. And um, We yeah. know that families have those better outcomes if they do come to most appointments. And then I guess um, from a personal perspective, I don't think I would have gone on to have any more children other than the first one if it wasn't for my maternal and child health nurse and for that maternal child health service. Uh, and I went on to have four children, so four babies. And I really think that the support that was gained from the service couldn't be underestimated. And I guess that's what we'd love to do for new parents. We want to support them so that they can enjoy their babies, they can get their questions answered, they can have that support throughout that really helps make parenting so much more fun. Belinda, I fully understand. I'm also a mother and the child health nurses were a lifeline to me and they certainly provided the reassurance that, that I was doing okay and that my child was doing well. And as you say, with the mother's group, um, just forming some of those you know very close bonds and um, being able to just talk to somebody who's at the same stage um, and their child is at the same age as yours. Well, thank you, Belinda. That concludes our session for tonight. Um, and we thank Belinda for providing these insights to the very important role that the early childhood health nurses and their services are providing to our new parents. You can see more of Belinda and her book on the website, on her website, and we will link that in the post. Now, please remember, if you do have any concerns about your baby's health or specific questions about topics covered tonight, please contact your maternal and child health nurse, doctor or an appropriate health professional. Now thank you everyone for watching and we hope to see you next time. Good night from Baby Bunting.